All right. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to get started. Um, thanks for coming up. I think I'm only up here. I hope I'm not going out there. But anyway, um, thanks for not choosing perfect parenting or hope in a sex saturated culture. Um, hopefully, I'll have some good stuff, but I think those are good too. So you can watch the videos when they come out a little bit later. Um, today, we're going to talk about parenting through the phases. But actually, as I was preparing for this, kind of went a slightly different direction. We'll get back to it, I promise. Uh, but I wanted to do some setup material a little bit. Um, so if you want to talk about, we'll talk about phases, and that's actually what the handout is. So you'll get stuff taking home, and it'll provide reading material while I talk. But um, I want to talk for a few minutes um, on some six things that kids need. And it comes from this book here, Playing for Keeps. On the back side, it's a, there's a fiction piece called Losing Your Marbles. But... Um, anyways, so that's where most of this information comes from, and uh, it's not necessarily my original material. Um, I use that book a lot. So um, we're talking about that today. I have a little time for discussion. Maybe if, you're, if you have both parents happen to be up here, maybe some chance to converse a little bit, or if both parents aren't, you're divided and conquer, that's fine too, um, but you might have some time hopefully to think through some of the things that I'm talking about. Then we'll get to the phases and hopefully a little more time to think. So we're going to talk, first of all, about six things that I think every child needs, and it comes from that book. And the first thing is time, love, words, stories, tribes, and fun. All right, so we'll get to all those. Um, also, too, I'm going to be saying a lot, so I'll try to the main points are on the PowerPoint, um, so you can just kind of sit and listen to some of that, But because I'll go by pretty fast, because um, I work with kids a lot, so I have to talk fast. Anyways, first thing we're going to talk about is time over time equals history. Okay, Time over time equals history, and it takes time over time to make history worth... Yeah, thanks. Um, and it takes time over time to make a history worth repeating. So, um, get rid of that. I thought I turned notifications off. Um, so, and if you haven't already lost your marbles, I want to show you an illustration today, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And um, I referred to it in the main session, from birth to age 18, or graduation, you know, there's a some variables in that, but around 936 weeks. So I have over here, I'll duck back this way, about 936 marbles. The box said 1,000, so I counted down, so I can't guarantee, but about 936 marbles. If you have a newborn, does anybody here have a, like, fresh kind of newborn? Anyways, that's about how much time you have left before they graduate and move on. Um, this is a second grader. You see it's down just a little bit. Um, sixth grader. How much time you have left? Eleventh grader. Um, so you might go, wow, Chris, thanks. That's super depressing. Um, you're really stressing me out, man. The, my anxiety is going through the roof. Well, that's obviously not the point, but... And you might even actually think about doing that at home. But the takeaway is not freaking out, okay? What if today you could find some balance between living in total denial that kids will pack their bags and move out one day and the sheer panic that makes you want to double lock the doors and make sure no one ever leaves, okay? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about, the balance in that today. Now, because, you know, time is ticking away, um, there's an old song that says that, um, also doesn't mean that you have to worry and stress about every single second, making sure that every second counts, making sure that you've got the chart, that you've got, they have to learn something new today, otherwise the rest of their future is no good. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, some people are really good at journaling. That has never been one of my strong suits because for me, that's insanity, right? But what if you decided to make history one week at a time, okay? Thinking about what happens over the course 
of your week. Because see, kids don't know what they're doing this week is making history, right? They're kids. They know what they did today, right? I built a snowman. We saw a movie. Uh, we did a pillow and blanket fort in the living room, right? Um, you might have to clean up some crazy messes. They don't even remember that they did that, right? Because they're just thinking about now. But you as an adult see today, yesterday, and tomorrow, right? And if you have um, a child that's at least two years old, that all of a sudden one day they just go and start walking. No, there was a series of steps, right? It took place over time. So again, we're talking about time over time equals history. And so as you're present in your child's life, that's what you're doing. You're creating time over time. So again, you want to look at as a week as important and something that you need to do and be present. Um, but I'm not saying you have to watch every single second because there's no such thing as instant character. There's no such thing as instant faith. Um, and what you can do is keep investing in what you can't see, trusting that time over time will do what God decided it was going to do. Because think about it for a second. If God decided, you know, I can help you understand some things that with time you can't understand in a moment, right? So if God uses time, we can use it too. Um, we don't experience worth because one time someone said, I love you, right? It happens over time. We don't understand the world through a single event, but through a collection of stories over time. So maybe keeping a jar and losing your marbles one week at a time isn't your thing. Um, but think about this. What about a countdown clock? If you have a game or a competition or exercise, and you know the clock's ticking down, your energy amps up a little bit, right? The last second shot. Um, your energy and passion get focused as you get closer to zero. A couple things more on time to think about. Uh, we aren't raising kids. We're raising adults. And that takes time. And what you do over time will create a positive impact and have a greater impact because it takes place over time. Again, building that relationship. So ordinary things, going to a movie, building a snowman, even if you don't like to sing the song while you do it, um, building a blanket fort, those things, ordinary things, over time, can make an extraordinary difference. And that's the power of time. So what you do this week does matter. All right, so time over time equals history. Next one. Love over time equals worth. I'm going to argue that love over time is what the one thing that matters most. Because um, you're here today at a church, I'm sure you already know who came up with the idea of love. That was God. Um, he's a pretty good innovator. I think he did a pretty good job on most things. Um, but if you believe love was God's idea at first, then that helps some other things fall into place as well. Um, if it's his idea, it's interesting, though, how sometimes we go through life acting like it doesn't matter. Uh, think about the Pharisees for a moment. They were so busy doing things. Now, they were important, but they were doing important things like working harder, keeping rules, constantly being at the temple, praying longer, doing more than anyone else, studying the scriptures more. Um, and those are important things, right? Right? What did Jesus have to say to them at one point? He had to clarify what was the most important, right? And he said this in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on, the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So think about it. Loving God helps you love yourself and helps you love others. Loving others helps you love God and helps you love yourself. Loving yourself helps you love God and helps you love others. It's all intertwined. So I'd also say that in the child's life, love matters even more than it does in a, as an adult. Because in a child, love is like investing, right? 
um, I have a retirement account, and I was really pleased with the results this year. Um, my investment that I put in years ago is now starting to add up, which is nice as I get older, right? Love is like that too. As you invest it in the life of a child, the dividends, the, the shares that you get back are much greater than if you wait till they're older. Um, it'll just earn more interest. Now again, we can still love each other and adults still need love too, right? Um, guys, your wife still needs love today even though she's not a child. Um, it, but as an adult, the gains we get from that are a lot slower. Uh, the interest doesn't multiply near as much. Um, so if you want your kids to grow up and know they're worth it, then what you need to do is look for ways to prove that over time. Again, just a one and done thing probably is not going to have the greatest impact that you'd like. Kids and teenagers need adults who show up consistently, patiently, and regardless of what they do. Um, I'm old. Some of you will get this joke. If you want them to know that love is more than just a second-hand emotion, they need someone in their lives that will not bolt or run when things get messy. You as parents get to be that. Kids need to know that that's how love works. Love, it's what love does and why love matters. Um, my kids are all young adults now. And uh, I still think it's super awesome because every once in a while, my 21-year-old daughter, when she's home, not at school, she'll actually want to sit in my lap and give me a hug and snuggle a little bit as much as a 21-year-old can do that. But it's awesome, right? Um, and now that we've moved back to Peoria, my parents happen to live in this area. And so I know that that's one of my mom's love languages. So whenever we go over to visit, make sure I give my mom a big hug, right? Over time, it makes a difference. And as a parent, it's nice sometimes to feel that back because when they're throwing a tantrum, when they're little and things are happening, you don't always feel that coming back at you, right? Um, now, a little caveat here, because love is super important, that doesn't say there's no rules, there's no consequences. That's not, not what I'm saying. Actually, giving kids guidance and boundaries and correction and instructions actually are a sign of love. So if you think about kid not having any of those, that usually doesn't turn out well if they have no boundaries or guidelines. So actually giving our kids rules, we prove to them that they care. And when they break the rules, because they will, if you think back, you probably did too, right? If we as parents show up, we prove to them that, that we still care. We prove to them that they have worth and that we're committed to them even when it's difficult, inconsistent, and messy. And again, it's kind of what God did for us, right? So love over time equals worth. Another one, words over time. Give direction. A few, for, a few short words over time can impact someone's direction in life. Um, I've had some, my parents invested in me, some teachers um, said some things. You saw the funny picture of me and my kids when we were younger. I played the bassoon because a band teacher said, hey, I think you're, you could be good at this. I'm like, oh, what do I know? I'll try that. Um, and it ended up being super great and made an impact even to my life today. So words matter. Um, funny story, about 15 years ago or so, um, I was interviewing at a church for a children's pastor position. And uh, one of my sons, I won't name his name, although he said I could, but um, he's, he'd always impressed people with his vocabulary. Um, when he was like two-ish, he told everyone that bats were nocturnal, um, and he knew what it meant. They slept in the day and were awake at night. And, um, but in this instance, he chose an interesting series of words when asked by the executive, executive pastor who was sitting across the table for us at lunch to tell him a little something about himself. My 10-year-old, without batting an eye, looked directly at the executive pastor and goes, most people don't know this, but I'm a vampire. Um, I, of course, was mortified. Um, uh, I didn't know where that came from. Uh, we hadn't been watching. He was 10. We weren't watching vampire movies. We didn't have vampire books. I had no idea where his imagination had come up with that. Um, 
And the only thing I could stammer out at that time was, wow, Jonathan, uh, I didn't know that either. <laughs> um, now, I did get the job so because the executive pastor laughed and thought it was super funny, but that was a situation where my 10-year-old quite scared me because of his vocabulary. Um, here's Anybody have older kids, like teenagers? Um, okay. Um, according to my daughter, this is just a couple weeks ago, she's 21, so she's a little bit older, but um, I learned some new language, some new words that I try to get in because sometimes it bugs her, and it's kind of a fun thing we do. But she taught me a new word, so I'll share them with you. Two of them, actually, the word is slaps and banger. And so what does that mean? Anybody got any idea? You want to take a guess? All right. So in context, in the current slang, it means things are good or great. So especially when talking about music, because my daughter likes music, um, that song really slaps means that it's really good. Or that song's a banger means it's really, really good. Okay, there you go. Just some words that you may not ever use again, but words change too, right? So kind of keeping track of what's going on, um, and it's fun. Um, an old word that I used back a while ago that's no longer in current, um, meaning things are okay, we're all good. Um, that's Gucci. Um, it's, again, older slang. And so I still try to throw that one in because my daughter's like, oh, come on, Dad. You are getting old. Anyway, um, but uh, let's go back. Long, long time ago, everything started with a word, right? God spoke, it came into being, he said, let there be light, and it happened. And words have been helping us see ever since. So words not only affect what we see, but they help us as we influence others and in what they see. Words don't necessarily have to be huge or like 50 cent or, you know, $10 words, but even small words can have tremendous influence. They can impact direction. And you as parents have the opportunity over time to give your kids words that will help them reason, to win, and believe. Science actually says one of the greatest indicators of a child's future success is vocabulary. Um, now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend teaching your kids vampire, um, but, you know, that's up to you. If you want kids to know that they matter, then it matters what words you use when you talk to or about them. Uh, some of you might have had this experience with words. Um, have you ever had a child repeat a word that you didn't know they knew? Maybe one that you really hoped they didn't learn? And then you realize that, oh, that's a word that I use? And they catch it. I don't have an answer here, but why is it that sometimes they pick up the words we don't want them to know a lot easier than the right words, right? Like, why is please and thank you so much more difficult than bleep, right? Um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, but I have another good story that goes along with that. So again, my daughter, when she was, I don't know, knee high, um, little curly haired thing, and uh, she had two older brothers, and uh, I think it's in an old Disney movie. Um, but she, what she heard uh, when her brother said, you want a piece of me, was you want a piece of meat. So here's this little like 25 pound thing, running around looking at her brothers and giving them like the mean face, you want a piece of meat. And so, right, as a parent, I thought that was super funny, but that was when she was angry. <laughs> and so I had to kind of back off on my laughter because laughing at her choice of words didn't make her any happier. But so words can make a difference in how we use them is important. Kids and teenagers also need theological words, right? Um, in order to understand aspects about God's nature. Words matter, or words you give them matter when it comes to faith. Um, and so explaining them, we talked about sacraments, we talked about ordinances, explaining them, we talked about testimony, not necessarily words that they would use in a conversation with their friends, but you get a chance to help shape their faith with words. So maybe that's why God gave us words over time, to communicate love, to build each other up, and to move in a better direction. So this week, when you say something, say it so it matters. And say it to someone so that they know they matter, right? A few words can make a big difference. All right, words over time. Let's go to stories over time and perspective. 
so they can move us to imagine, and stories create imagination. Have you ever wondered what, I'm going to list three things, have in common? Listen to this. What do you think? Grandparents, fiction, and the Bible. They have in common. Any ideas? Probably never thought about it. May not have put those words together. They tell stories, right? Yeah. Um, they represent actually three different kinds of stories that shape a child's perspective. So I'm not saying the Bible is fiction. That's not what I'm saying. Or fiction is more important than the Bible. But I just believe teenagers, kids need stories from all three of those sources to build the kind of history over time that they need. Um, now, some of your children may not have grandparents to hear those stories, but they still need stories maybe from you or maybe from a relative about their history, about their family, where they come from, why we're here, what's going on like that. My kids love hearing their mom, even to this day, tell them about how they were born and what happened that day. It doesn't, I'm no good at it in that one. I mean, I was there, but I'm no good at telling that story. Um, and I, it's not important to me, but it's super important to them. And my wife sees that. And so they still get to hear that story. Um, kids need to hear fiction stories. Jesus used fiction in the Bible. We call them parables today, right? He used stories to tell what he was talking about or illustrate what he was talking about. Um, stories, fiction, help us connect to culture around us, right? Develop values, and you think of big picture epic stories, maybe like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or things like that, big epic stories. Man, they help fire off a kid's imagination and, and what they see and connect to a bigger world. Kids also need stories from the Bible because we want kids and teenagers to connect to the mysteries of the universe and the creative and loving God. And they would miss out on that spiritual history if they didn't have or receive the words that lead to that. So I believe God created the human brain to connect to stories, right? We all enjoy a really good narrative. So that's why today you might forget most of what I say, but you might remember that my son used vampire in an interview um, with his dad. And uh, stories ignite our imagination. See, without imagination... You can't see past what you already know. You can't care how someone else feels. You can't hope beyond your present situation. We talk a lot about hope around here, right? Stories work together over time to build a child's emotional, relational, and moral intelligence. Um, Jesus even put us into stories. He appealed to the imagination. He said, we're like a casual hiker who stumbles across an incredible pearl in the middle of a field. He said, we're like a woman who badgers and pleads with an unjust judge until he gives in. So parents, I challenge you to do whatever you can to amplify the best stories around you. Read them, watch them, tell them, create them, and live them out. Stories can transform a child's perspective. They can make faith fuller, deeper, and hope stronger. Stories over time move us to imagine a world beyond ourselves. Moving along. Tribes over time equal belonging to help us show where we belong. Um, some of you might be able to remember back to middle school um, and some of the awkwardness of that age. And you were wondering, am I in the right place? Do I belong? Do I have friends? What's going on? Um, now, I know we're adults now, and hopefully we don't give in to peer pressure maybe the way we did as kids. But even as adults, we still want to belong, right? It's super easy to feel awkward, uncomfortable, and alone. Most of us have been there. We're all trying to fit in somewhere. But people need people. And I think some of the experiences over the last couple of years with COVID have actually emphasized that. We need people. Everybody needs a circle. Every kid needs a tribe. So what's a tribe? Simply some, a group of people connected by something in common. I like to play music. Some people are Green Bay Packers fans. You might have a tribe of foodies. Be conservative, liberal. You can be a reader. You can be a hiker. All different sorts of tribes. Sports, they give circles for you to move in, in, in and out of as you discover who you are and where you belong. As a parent, you play a critical role in two specific areas, amongst others, but two primary tribes, the church and your family, right? When God wanted to redeem creation, he started with a tribe. 
Actually, there were 12 of them, but he chose them to represent and redeem creation. The Apostle Paul wrote letters to connect a group of believers together to a larger tribe. The people connected together by a common trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus. So God designed us so that we'd connect with people like us. He used tribes over time to reveal himself to us and to spread his message of love. If you watch TV, if you read the news, marketers also use tribes to sell us stuff, right? If you buy this, you will be like this, right? You may not buy it or you may not believe it, but they are using tribes as well. Think of the story of the prodigal son when he's welcomed back by his father, back into his tribe, so to speak. God sent us a message, right? There's still a place at the table. There's a place where you're known. There's a place where you're welcome. There's a place where you're forgiven. And there's a place where you belong. Kids need tribes like that. The idea of belonging is one of the things that makes our faith as Christians distinctive. Our sense of belonging is rooted in the concept of grace, right? You don't belong because you deserve it. You belong because God accepted and forgave you. And you're known by God in a way that you're not known by anyone. And yet, even though he knows our deepest, darkest secrets, right? He accepted us back. And he welcomed us into his tribe because of Jesus and wants you to be a part of it forever, right? Kids need to know that they're welcome. And kids need to know that they're forgiven. And kids need to know, be known before they belong. So what you do to connect kids and teenagers into a tribe matters this week because every child needs a place to belong over time. All right. And my favorite, fun over time. Fun over time makes a relationship grow deeper. Uh, Fun matters. I think it's super important. One of the most effective ways to stay connected with your kids is to have fun with them. So what do I mean by fun? Pretty much anything that entertains them, makes them laugh, helps them enjoy life. Now you're the adult, right? So I hope you screen a few things with some common sense. There's definitely some things a kid shouldn't do because it's not safe or age appropriate or they break a major commandment, for example. But think about this. Try to make sure your don't list doesn't overshadow your do list. That might cause you to get creative. Try to give kids a bigger list of do's than don'ts. Just a thought. How much fun can you have? God decided to illustrate fun everywhere in nature. So if you think about dolphins swimming in a pod, right? Um, I like watching squirrels out on my back deck run up and down the trees and chase each other. Um, Monkeys in the zoo, um, super fun. Um, and, uh, you also might think about this. If you're not sure that fun matters, you might have a serious problem. And that problem is being too serious. Um, if you want kids and teenagers to show up fun, if you want to build a deeper relationship with your kids, fun. Um, now let's talk a little bit about that. Sometimes we get confused with fun. Because I think sometimes we think at one point as we're growing up, we realize, hey, sin is fun, right? Um, And it is. And some ways along the line, somewhere we get starting to confuse things and think that sin can be fun, but that doesn't mean that all fun is sin, right? We don't want to get those confused. Um, But I would postulate maybe that it is a sin not to have fun. Um, fun's not a great word for you. Maybe think about the word joy. It's maybe a better church word. Um, now also there's obviously there's difficult things and there's hard stuff going on in our world right now for sure. And God did call us to self-discipline and sacrifice. That's a hundred percent true. But don't forget, God also called us to celebrate. God called us to fellowship. God ch- called us to live fully and to enjoy. The word fun's not necessarily in the Bible, but all the relatives are there. Here's a couple examples. May the righteous be glad. Rejoice in the Lord always. And a time to dance. Celebrate a festival to the Lord. Worship the Lord with gladness. The fruit of the Spirit is 
joy, and others. However many years one may live, let them enjoy it all. So on the seventh day, God didn't sleep. He rested from his creation, but he enjoyed what he had made. So again, I would say Christians should be the most joyful, positive, happy, playful, fun people on the planet. Science says fun literally lights up the brain when we play. It's not a waste of time. And fun over time can make your relationships grow deeper. Fun over time convinces your kids you actually like them. Fun over time reconnects what has has been disconnected. It's hard to have fun if there's conflict, right? Fun over time fosters resilience. That's a big word right now. And fun over time authenticates forgiveness. This is where you can also learn from your kids. I don't know if you've ever seen a kid sometimes have a fight or get in an argument with somebody, and the next thing you know, they're back in the sandbox again playing, right? They sometimes can get over things really fast. And so sometimes they can show us how fun is more important than holding a grudge. Um, My household... We loved our wrestling matches when the kids kids were little. Um, and then as all three of them started to get a little bit bigger, dad couldn't quite handle all three. Um, but anyway, so our fun changed. But we had a lot of fun. Uh, it changed into them making fun of beating me at video games. That was never my thing. And with all the new stuff now, I'm like, I just can't keep up with A, B, and too many thumb things. Um, so they had fun um, poning dad, which means winning. Um, and even today, um, just the other day, they were sending crazy memes and stuff to me on my phone, and we have sort of insider comments and having fun as a family. Not everyone gets our version of fun, but we do, right? And that's what's important. So not everything in life is fun, true, but you as parents have an opportunity this week to make something fun, all right? You want to make it fun because you can build trust, have a lasting influence, establish a deeper connection when fun is there. So, to wrap up this part, visit your child's world. And how many times can you keep doing playing a game, telling them a story, giving them a tribe, saying it again, and prove to them you love them again and again because time and over time It matters. Um, Take just a second, since I've talked a lot, giving you a lot of stuff. If you're with your spouse, um, you can talk together. If not, take a minute and a second and look through those things or think about those things. And uh, what's one thing maybe you could do this week to start building up that time bank? Or maybe if you're super creative, You don't need one thing for each of the areas. Maybe you can do one thing that incorporates a lot of them. So just take a few seconds. Um, How can you do something to start building up over time in this next week? We were doing Barbies when my daughter was little. I'd do Barbies. I didn't have a problem with that as a dad. But I was my character had to be named Barbecue. I just thought that was funny. So I'd play Barbies, but it had to be Barbecue. I'm just saying. <laughs> but that's great, though. But right? It's super fun. It's fun for us. <laughs> I think dads, maybe moms too, but from a dad, fun is 
way more fun or doing stuff with your kids is way more fun when you're having fun right yeah the beast doll that's great It can be. All right, let's talk just for a few minutes about phases. Um, you can take out the handout if you want. And uh, we're going to look through this. And this is kind of where it gets a little more personalized, where your kids are at and things like that. But a couple of resources that I want you to have, not other than so just these. I don't have copies and stuff for everyone, but you can take a look. A lot of this material and some of what I'm going to be talking about next um, came from Parenting Through the Phases, which actually is a series of books. Um, and both of these are on store.thinkorange.com. Um, and you can pick them up. They said we didn't have it in the budget to buy everybody a set of these. Um, but um, over on the ping pong table, there's a series of books um, that take you through your child each year, okay? And um, there's some cards there that kind of, uh, it's a series um, that do the same thing, but just in a shorter, more condensed form. There's a couple of the cards packs down on the resource table. Um, they say baby on top, but it's for the whole thing. So if you didn't catch that, they're there. But um, so let's talk a little bit about through the phases and as your kid changed. Um, in case you didn't know, parenting is harder than you think it is, right? Um, you know, when you're young, maybe newly married, you're like, Psh, I got this, this parenting thing. Uh, and then you have kids and you're like, wow, your kids trick us, right? They don't intend to necessarily, but, you know, you figure out, you think you figured out how your baby wants to sleep. And then guess what? They get older, right? And things change. And then now it's this time and this um, baby food. When our kids were little, you'd try, oh, here's some squash. And they'd be like, freaking out. And then two weeks later, you try, here's some squash. And they'd be like, right? Things change over time. Um, but because you're a grown up, because you're an adult, you keep trying. Because you're an adult, you know what's best for them and you want them to do what is right. But kids are constantly changing. Every phase of a child's life has a unique potential. So a phase is a time frame. Do I have a slide? I didn't. Um, a phase is a time frame in a kid's lives when you can leverage distinctive opportunities to influence their future. Okay? Leveraging where they're at to influence their future. So on, I think it's on the front of this, it says love God at the top. So we're going to talk, just break this down for a second. I'll let you read all of it, but... Let's hit a couple things. So if you look at kind of the top um, upper on the left, so if you think about kids in early childhood, birth through age four, they think like an artist. They're very abstract. They're very creative. Um, you know, a stick figure or a circle is dad. It's a picture of dad, right? Um, they're very motivated by safety, motivated by safety, excuse me. Um, you know, kid hanging to your leg and won't let go right? Um, but as you think about that in the different phases there, what they're asking is, am I safe? And they get a little older, am I able? You know, I'm walking, can I do this? Um, you know, I'm a big kid now, that kind of stuff. And am I okay? Right? As they get a little bit older. And so you can kind of go down through the chart and look through those things. And then if you go down on the bottom part, so what can we do as parents? Um, we can incite wonder, right? So they will know God's love and meet uh, and exposing them to God's family. Um, one of the great things to do with this young age group, right? Again, get them going on their imagination. Look at that cloud. Does that look like a horse? Isn't it cool that God made horses, right? So devotions aren't probably something that's, let's sit down and read the Bible for 45 minutes and we'll talk about God. No, you can put it as a part of your everyday life, especially um, in the younger age. I don't think I've ever sat down too often and had a 45-minute devotional, even myself. But anyways, it's a different topic. But um, as they're young, incite wonder. The way to 
to, to help them is to embrace their physical needs, right? As they move a little older, things like a scientist motivated by fun. You think of early uh, elementary school and through elementary school. And then as they get into middle school, um, they think like an engineer, how do things work? What, how does this break? What's happening? What's going on? Um, acceptance. High school, like a philosopher. Again, because I have older kids, um, I've lost a lot of intelligence. Um, and uh, actually now my oldest is coming back, which is awesome feeling as a dad. Um, but I remember when I was 18, 19, parents didn't so much. Um, then I got a little older, got married, and I'm like, ah, oh, my dad is pretty smart. He knows a few things. So I'm at the phase of life where I'm, I've lost a lot of intelligence, but I'm slowly starting to gain it back. So just a little word on the future. Um, but anyways, provoke discovery, fuel passion, and as they grow. So leveraging each of their phases. This just gives you an idea. Um, this isn't directly Northwoods material, but um, so some of these things don't necessarily apply, but it gives you an idea of things as they go. Um, again, uh, late elementary, do I have friends? That's a super important question at that age. If you as a parent can be ready for those kind of questions, that's great. All right? So think, kids think differently. There are also going to be things that catch you off guard, um, things you don't anticipate will happen, right? You can't know something's coming if you don't anticipate it. So as a parent, start thinking through some of the things that you know will happen, right? You will help your child learn how to use the bathroom, all right? You can anticipate it. You can plan for it. You can think about it. You don't have to get furious in the moment. Um, eventually, your children will lose a tooth, right? I think that's a super fun stage. At least it was in my household. It wasn't traumatic. Uh, it was super fun. Hey, I lost a tooth. I'm getting big. Um, you can anticipate that. At some point, um, nowadays, it gets younger and younger. They're going to want a cell phone. And, I, and because they're um, thinking like a scientist or an engineer, um, they're going to come with the goods, right? They're going to have their reasons and their rationales. So again, anticipate what's going on. Sometimes though, as a parent, it's hard to anticipate, right? Life's busy. You probably have more on your plate than just your eight-year-old. Um, life's loud. There's all sorts of competing voices trying to tell us. And also, as you anticipate, not saying live in fear, but it helps you to be prepared. So that doesn't mean that you have to fear what's coming. It should help you be prepared. So um, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, too, to use maybe some of these. Maybe you have some other resources. Think about, again, as we talked about over time, it doesn't all have to happen in a week. But think about some big picture ideas of where you want your family, where you want your kids to go. Not like today we do this, tomorrow that, not that kind of thing. Some of you are really great at that, but big picture ideas. Um, so when things get off the track a little bit, as they always do, you have a few words or a few ideas to kind of bring you back to get you going in the right direction. Um, so there's kind of four areas. I have three of them here. I don't know why in the material it didn't give me one on health because that's important. Um, that's one of the things that they talk about in this series. Um, talking about healthy habits, so strengthening the body through exercise, nutrition, and self-advocacy. Um, but there's information here on some steps of authentic faith. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, sexual integrity. It's never too young to start talking to kids about important things related to their bodies and how, now again, age appropriateness there. I like this chart because it gives you some ideas. Um, they will have questions. Anticipate that. Be prepared. Another little quick parenting tip as they have questions, ask them questions with their questions because they might ask you, so um, how are babies made? And, you, and they're like three. And you're like, uh, they're three. They don't know, barely even know their own body parts yet. Um, but you can say, oh, well, babies are created inside of the mom. Again, simple, short, sweet. Um, and as they get older, obviously, the answers get more complex, right? But um, it's never too young to start talking about themselves and how their body works. Um, technological responsibility. Um, Jason Lee does a nice job about that here. Um, but here's some ideas um, as you think about plans for that. Now, again... Use this material as a jumping off point, right? 
your kid's not going to hit everything exactly right or where it says they are. That's okay. Again, don't stress out about that. But again, look for the big picture and in mind. Kind of give yourself a direction where you want to go. And I want to jump back to the faith one, if I could, for just a minute. Um, trusting Jesus in a way that transforms how I love God, myself, and the rest of the world. Um, okay, we can focus in that direction. Help our kids move that way. Another way that you might want to talk about faith, as far as big picture goes, is um, am I helping my kid have a relationship with God that outlasts my time with them as a parent directly in my house. So like, will they help them continue to have faith once they leave high school? Um, are you taking steps? Are you helping over time to make that happen? Um, so keeping the end in mind also keeps you from being a spur of the moment person, although you can do that too. But if you're planning ahead, I lost my place in my notes. Um, you can think about not necessarily what just happens to your kid right now, the temper tantrum that they're throwing at the grocery store right now. Um, but you know, as a parent, you can learn that over time, if you give in right there, right now, that can set you up for stuff that you might not want to deal with later. So even though it's hard as a parent to pick your child up, take them out of a situation or do whatever, Giving in to what they want isn't always the best right now because you know what the end result that you're going for. Um, and uh, I think we're running out of time. So, oh, real quick. Um, if you have older kids, is it too late? No. Where you start isn't as important as where you're going, right? So again, if you think of where you want to go, you can always start. You can always invest again over time. You as a parent are the best judge of what your kid needs to hear and when they need to hear it. Again, information, charts, that's all good stuff, but you know your kids better than anyone else. Um, there's what I wanted to say. If you can keep the end in mind and know where you are now, you can always do something that will lead kids in a better direction. Let me pray. God, you're awesome. Thanks for teaching us about you over time. God, I pray for our parents here that they would have patience over time. Um, God, give them the strength that can only come from you and to help us to rely on you for that as we raise our kids. We love and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.